This week on The Communicators, our guest is Blair Levin, the executive director of the FCC's National Broadband Plan. Blair Levin is the executive director of the Broadband Initiative for the Federal Communications Commission, and with the release of the National Broadband Plan, 350 plus pages. Mr. Levin, the opposition to the broadband plan has been rather muted. Are you surprised by that? Um, actually, we've been very, very happy with the, uh, the response to the plan. It's a comprehensive document, and I think what you saw was that a lot of people, even though they disagree with really elements of it, have, number one, a great appreciation for the work that went into it, number two, a great appreciation for the professionalism. It's a serious document. It goes through the data. It's very data-driven. Um, it's very analytic. Uh, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't react to uh, things that don't exist in the real world. Uh, it tries to lay out a path that's both visionary and practical, and I think there was a great appreciation for that. Um, uh, and, and third, I think that it, uh, there was an understanding and appreciation that it is being very transparent about what the government agenda should be. Obviously, there are lots of details that are not appropriate for the planning process, but rather appropriate for the government as it starts to implement uh, those things. So we were very, very pleased that a wide variety of folks, uh, from all, all folks, uh, all, all sectors, industry, the public interest groups, elected officials, uh, state regulators, a lot of folks um, gave us a lot of praise and we certainly appreciated it. And one of, one of the critiques that came down was from Nicholas Johnson, a former FCC commissioner. Yes. And he wrote in the Des Moines Register, as a result, the National Broadband Plan offers broadband consumers no hope of protection from price gouging by limited competition phone and cable companies earning upwards of 80% profit margins. Now, I disagree with that critique. I think there are a lot of very pro-competitive things in the plan. I think Mr. Johnson, with due respect, completely ignores uh, a number of, for example, of spectrum recommendations. That what we're seeing in various places in the world is that while wireless is not a complete, perfect uh, competitor, it does, in fact, as it, as it has done with voice, uh, provide an alternative way that forces a market-based mechanism uh, of, of putting some price constraints on certain fixed offerings. We also think that he ignores uh, some other things that we're doing to be pro-competitive in the piece. And I would note, it's, it's interesting, um, while we've received that criticism from some, yesterday at the House hearing, there wasn't a single member of the House who criticized us for not uh, being aggressive enough, as Mr. Johnson would be. But there were a number of members of the House who said, hey, you guys went too far. <laughs> so I find uh, that criticism, um, uh, you know, not, not really... Um, uh, a, a valid criticism, uh, in my view. Well, uh, Republican Representative John Shimkus no. from Arizona, this is what he had to say at a hearing this week in Congress. 95% of our people have broadband. 5% do not. You know where they're at? They're in my district. You know what? The stimulus fund is not going to them. And the RUS fund is not going to them. And that's what torques people off. 95% of us have it. It's the private sector that's rolled it out, and now we want to take over one-sixth of the economy, another one-sixth of the economy, through moving this whole information age from Title I to Title II, the dirty little secret back here. It's already been exposed. We're not going to get a surprise from the chairman this time in the hearing because it's here. Some commenters have suggested a second approach in which the SEC would implement certain plan recommendations under its Title II authority. So let's have this hearing, let's have this debate. The system is working where it's not working is in rural America, which we spend billions of dollars and the money's not going there. And of course, John Chimkis is from Illinois, but your response to his substantive comments. Yeah, well, well first of all, I would say that uh, he appears to be critical of something that was not really part of the plan, which was how the stimulus dollars are being spent. Um, uh, and that, that's a worthwhile debate and one can have that. Our focus on the plan was actually to address his concern. There are 7 million American homes uh, that do not have access to broadband, and we have a very detailed, uh, comprehensive uh, reform package for universal service, which spends about $8 billion a year, but is not spending it in a way that is likely to connect those homes. Uh, we figured out a way in which we need to shift dollars around to do that without raising the assessment that consumers currently pay 
on their telephone bill for universal service. What about his critique of switching it from Title I to Title II, number one? What does that mean, and how do you feel about his view? Yeah. Um, under the current law, which was adopted in 1996, uh, there is a distinction between the regulation of traditional telephone companies uh, under what is called Title II uh, and kind of um, uh, what, are, what are sometimes thought of advanced services, which are uh, under Title I. Uh, this is a very complicated legal argument. There are very important issues, but frankly, the plan didn't get into that at all because we took the view, and we were very clear about this from the beginning, that our, our, the purpose for us in the plan was to develop a data-driven um, set of recommendations that we thought were important for the government to take action on. And, and by the way, the thing that he's absolutely wrong about is this notion of taking over one-sixth of the economy. We're, we're not proposing that in any way. In fact, our view was to look at what are the levers of government that government traditionally does, such as control of spectrum, such as universal service, such as control of rights of ways, and ask the question, are we doing it in ways that help for the broadband ecosystem, or, or are we doing it in ways that are inefficient? And we found in pretty much every case that there were enormous inefficiencies that needed to be corrected. Uh, so I think his characterization is wrong. Now, as to that Title I and Title II, the plan itself doesn't go into it because we were focused on what are concrete, practical recommendations that will help make this country um, uh, better in terms of its broadband performance, and that the appropriate place to address the jurisdiction question really is in the follow-up rulemaking and implementation. We are joined also by Lynn Stanton, Telecommunications Reports. Another criticism that came up yesterday during the hearing was that the plan uh, could lead to FCC mandates for unbundling on broadband services in the same way that there were unbundling mandates on uh, regular voice service in the mm -hmm. 1990s. Yeah. And is that what, maybe you want to explain what unbundling is, but is that what you understand the plan to be suggesting? Well, look, there are a number of different things which are currently uh, under law that require incumbent phone companies uh, to share their facilities in various ways. Um, there has been, you know, there, there's a lot of different proposals for doing um, additional kinds of unbundling or in some other way requiring incumbents to share facilities. Um, there's a broad spectrum of those things. What we, what we said in the plan is that um, what we want to do is primarily drive private investment. And so, for example, um, you know, one of the things that has really driven private investment in, in the past is availability of spectrum. So we were focused on the spectrum issues that were very important. Another place is how do you drive investment to those areas in rural America uh, that aren't getting it. And so we have, you know, um, uh, various things for universal service reform. And then in the market where there is opportunities for competition, to what extent do you do that? Traditional bottleneck analysis. There are some things in the plan that, that really are uh, where we talk about how this fits into the context of competition, but a lot of those proceedings are very fact-based and very specific and more appropriate for specific rulemakings. So we uh, have a very pro-competitive agenda, uh, but what we were saying is for some of these things, those are already subject to existing FCC proceedings. The FCC ought to determine those proceedings. Um, for some other things, for example, with set-top boxes, we have a very pro-competitive um, section on uh, set-top boxes because that is one place where we think uh, we need to change the rules in order to drive private investment, drive innovation, drive American leadership in integrating uh, traditional uh, video with internet, um, uh, with internet services. If I could follow up on, sure. since you just mentioned set-top boxes, it seems as though the plan has sort of a vision of trying to get all three screens, as it were, uh, to be platforms that people might use to get on Absolutely. the internet. Um, it seems as though low, a lot of the low adopter populations, according to your own uh, data gathering, mm -hmm. uh, are relying more on mobile, the That's mobile right. screen. And why do you think that the television is, that, I mean, do you think that people just, they don't want to buy a physical computer and just using the set-top box and having that screen is going to be a, a real attraction for them if they're not interested in buying a computer? Um, there are a variety of different barriers to adoption, which uh, 10 years ago were, were probably, they, they weren't as significant from a public policy perspective. But now as we move to a world where if you want to get an edge, if you want your kid to be able uh, to do their homework uh, as well as other kids, 
they better have access to the internet at home because that's the primary tool now kids use uh, for doing homework. If you want to search for a job, the internet is the primary tool. If you want to train for a job, increasingly uh, job training is being done over broadband. So it's very important to make sure it is available on all screens. But there's a difference between what you can do on your mobile device and what you can do on a larger screen. Uh, so we're cognizant of that. We want to drive it everywhere. And we took the approach, and in this way, it was a little bit different than a lot of other national plans, that we want to drive uh, the velocity of commerce across all of the different parts of the ecosystem, not just increasing network performance, but increasing in enabling better devices. And one reason we focused on the set-top box was we looked at mobile devices and kind of general desktop devices didn't seem to be a problem. Seemed to be a lot of competition, a lot of innovation, a lot of very good things happening. Set-top box market was very different in terms of its competitive structure. So, and, and of course, the big thing is really the applications. And increasingly, broadband applications are going to be the way this country and all countries address uh, what in the past have been intractable problems. And we think one of the most important things about their plan, we think there are a lot of ways in which our plan is trying to get the country on the right side of history. It is fundamentally a call to action to, fall, uh, to follow where the macro technology and the macro markets are going. And, uh, and one of the ways to do that is to make sure that we have applications that really help us address healthcare, really help us address uh, education, um, that improve the performance of public safety and government generally. And so that's a, a really important part, and that has to be done across all kinds of devices, improvements in all kinds of networks, uh, and, very importantly, uh, a focus on applications that help drive our national purposes. Uh, another issue that was brought up at the hearing yesterday uh, had to do with television broadcasters and yes. the proposal in the plan that yes. they voluntarily return yes. uh, some of their spectrum. Representative Dingell didn't mm -hmm. really seem to buy that it was going to be voluntary. Right. Uh, if, if there's resistance from other members of Congress to the point that they don't go along with those things in the plan, that you need Congress to do, such as authorizing sharing spectrum yeah. uh, auction revenues with, uh, with the broadcasters for giving back the spectrum. Yes. Can the, does the FCC have enough carrots and sticks in its, to mix a metaphor, arsenal uh, yeah. to be able to accomplish this without uh, Congress? Uh, in terms of incentive auctions, the FCC does need the Congress to give the FCC tools to help it in the reallocation of spectrum. This is actually one of the parts of the plan that I think I'm, I'm most proud of because, again, it puts us on the right side of history. One of the fundamental uh, lessons that we learned in looking at it was the importance of spectrum and the difficulty of correcting if you don't have enough. Uh, there are a lot of other inputs into the broadband ecosystem that if it turns out you don't have enough of them, the market will create them, and that's perfectly fine. But no market can create <laughs> more spectrum. We have what we have. The problem is in the reallocation based on market forces. You know, I used to be uh, in the Wall Street analysis business, and if you had an investment um, company that was forced to invest money based on the way it invested 60 years ago, that company would go out of business right away. You can't do that. You have to react to what's going on today. The single biggest capital investment that the United States government makes every year in terms of the broadband ecosystem is how it allocates spectrum. And yet, in many ways, spectrum is being allocated not on the basis of markets, not on the basis of technology, not on the basis of consumer demand, but rather on the basis of history. So the FCC needs tools such as giving incumbents incentives to reallocate spectrum where that's what the market demand is. I feel very confident that if you look at where technology trends are going, where market trends are going, where advertising trends are going, that if the FCC is given those tools, there will be a sufficient number of broadcasters who will volunteer. We're actually asking, that in order to accomplish what we want, <coughs> it's a relatively small number of broadcasters in a relatively small number of cities that can create huge upside for the entire American um, uh, uh, economy. Uh, as well as, I think, creating upside for themselves. So that's really what we're asking for. And um, I think once that's well understood, um, Congress will feel that they should give us those tools. Should broadcasters be compensated for that spectrum? Um, w we think they should be. Uh, we think that uh, you know one of the interesting things to look at and to understand this, think of it this way. Uh, this is really about kind of how broadcasters themselves view the appropriate asset mix. 
broadcasters are all going to have a different point of view about that. If you're the CBS affiliate in New York, you may want to be able to do the Super Bowl and, and uh, NFL football in high definition, which requires more spectrum, than if you're running uh, home shopping networks, right? The CBS affiliate, uh, affiliate in New York is worth a lot more than the number 25 broadcaster in New York, right? But interestingly, their spectrum is worth exactly the same. So we think if we strike an incentive, we'll allow this, if the CBS affiliate wants to participate, great. They're probably less likely to want to do it. But the number 25 broadcaster in New York, who, by the way, isn't probably doing local news, they're going to have a different incentive structure. And so the key is, how do we allow, and it's not just about broadcasting, it's about all the spectrum, it's the government spectrum, it's mobile satellite services, how do we enable the market to send signals about the relative worth of spectrum versus existing business models? When it comes to the spectrum and spectral efficiency, uh, we have heard all along how it's been improved over the, the many years yes. it's been around, and uh, about Cooper's Law, mm -hmm. about spectral efficiency. Right. The government still has about 50% of the spectrum. Is right. that a correct statement? Uh, you know, but not all megahertz are equal. So it, it's, it, one can argue about that. There's, it requires a, a very sophisticated analysis. And, okay, when it comes to the beachfront, yeah. how much of that is still available? Well, look, uh, part of our point of view is you have to look at this over time in a dynamic basis. One of the things we're doing, and we make various recommendations, not just about uh, broadcast spectrum, but also about mobile satellite spectrum, also about government spectrum, that what you need, you, you need to look at it, what are the tools that send the signals? You know, I was at the FCC during the implementation of the 96 Act, and one of the things that taught me was you can't really know exactly what's going to happen in the world. You have to be able to course correct. You know, John Malone um, gave a great speech in 1992 in December in which he very accurately predicted that the forces of microprocessors, um, uh, digitization, and fiber optics would lead to a brand new exciting world. He got that exactly right. Then he went on to say, that brand new world is 500 channels. That was exactly wrong, right? And if a guy like John Malone can get it exactly wrong, uh, then, w then we all can, because there were these students at the University of uh, Illinois uh, in Champaign-Urbana who were inventing the thing called Mosaic that became Netscape that created a, a, a universe of an infinite number of channels. Now, Malone then course corrected, right, and helped create At Home, which was the country's uh, first um, m mass market broadband provider. And part of what we say in this plan is there are certain things we need to get right, like we need to get spectrum right, we need to get rights of way right, we need to get universal service right. But the market is going to do all kinds of things that we can't predict. We need to make sure that the inputs are appropriately um, available, and then let the market work its wonders. Now, one of the most important things uh, we think in the plan is understanding what are the barriers to using these tools to solve a number of our nation's problems. And so we go into, you know, what is preventing the best courses in the world from being offered to all students everywhere in terms of education? What's preventing our kids from going around with 25 pounds of textbooks in their backpacks that are probably out of date? instead of using the most up-to-date information that they get over an e-book. There are a lot of barriers to this use, and I think as you, as you see over time, as this gets implemented, um, uh, you know, you're going to see a lot more uses of it. But the, the important thing to understand, it's a call to action that understands we're going to have to course correct in a couple of years. There are going to be many developments that we can't anticipate now. This is C-SPAN's Communicators Program. Our guest is Blair Levin, who is the Executive Director of the Broadband Initiative for the Federal Communications Commission. Lynn Stanton with Telecommunications Reports is our guest reporter. Reed Hunt said in a speech recently that uh, part of the goal in the 1990s, and you work for him yes. uh, at the FCC in the 1990s, was to make broadband the new national medium. Was that a purpose of y'all's in the 1990s? Well, <laughs> uh, Reed is a much better historian than I am, and uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to you know become an historian maybe later in life, but I'm not going to do it now. What is certainly true, and and Reed is, was very very prescient in a lot of ways, was the understanding that every country uh, needs a common medium that has certain characteristics. I would say that there were a number of decisions that we made back then that were useful to to the internet and to broadband. Um, but really, it is the market driving it. The market has, uh, is speaking. You know, 
This morning I was reading something that said in, in early 2000 when asked, would you rather give up television or the internet? 80% uh, of the folks said we'd rather give up the internet. Today, a majority of people say they'd rather give up television. And if you look at the under 45, you know, it's like overwhelming in terms of that. That's, that's consumer speaking. That's the market speaking. It's very important that we make sure that broadband is widely available. It's very important that we make sure that um, it provides both a common medium for civic purposes. It's how people will engage with their government. It's how people will get uh, a lot of news. Uh, but we'll, it's important to let the market d uh, determine that. One of the ways that the plan proposes making uh, broadband more widely available is to require some future spectrum licensee to provide, or licensees to provide free or very low cost wireless service that would be presumably advertising based. Yeah. Um, but it acknowledges that ad supported telecom services haven't really taken off in the past yeah. and suggests that um, they might meet with more success mm -hmm. if, quote, appropriate business models can be identified, right. close quote. Is the FCC going to identify the business models? Will it be the prospective licensee? And in either case, uh, is there going to be an opportunity for some kind of pilot or test or proof of concept for that business model before someone goes and commits money in an auction? Yeah, it's a great question. Let me say a couple of things. One of the things we found very early on, and we're very public about it, was that the FCC didn't have the data that we thought we needed uh, to do certain things. So there are certain recommendations that we really felt we couldn't make without more sufficient data, but we were very concrete about here's the data that you, you need. I mean, the FCC is an agency, has to be up to date with what it's talk, what, what information it's getting, and it clearly needs better information about broadband. In addition, we said there are you know, no business would commit essentially billions of dollars um, uh, in various programs unless it had market tested it. So there are other very concrete recommendations about here's where we need to do pilot projects. Then. Uh, we do make where we thought we had the, the data or where there had been sufficient testing, we said we can make very concrete, granular, specific recommendations to, for example, reform universal service. As to the idea you had, it's actually not a recommendation of the plan. What we were saying was we need to revise the way we think about how we provide broadband to low-income individuals. And there are various programs, such as the so-called Lifeline Linka program that currently does it for telephony, where we need to run some pilots in order to determine how best to do it for broadband. As we're thinking about that, one should think about whether there's a spectrum-based approach that might over time be a complementary service or, or do other kinds of things. But we in no way had sufficient data uh, to be able to make that a concrete recommendation. So, uh, And I think there is a very valid question about whether that business model uh, would work. Again, we want to be both visionary and practical we were raising that as something that ought to be considered alongside other, uh, other things that we could more confidently recommend. Blair Levin, why in the broadband uh, plan proposal do you call for a contiguous nationwide ban for unlicensed use? Yeah, it's, a, it's a great question. Um, one of the things that we, uh, we, we focused on was what is it that we know and what is, again, how can we make sure that there's an opportunity uh, for technology to develop in a lot of different ways? We've seen great success uh, with various unlicensed technologies such as Wi-Fi in terms of improving um, uh, performance on broadband networks. Um, we think that we have to, that there are various business models that compete. There's a licensed business model. There's an unlicensed business model. They tend to do different kinds of things. Uh, we, one of the reasons why we think having spectrum is so important is that you need to have enough so that the licensed uh, providers can do what they need and you have the spectrum they need. But there's also an opportunity for unlicensed. And we think having a, continu a contiguous nationwide band would enable all kinds of technology and development. We also say in there that secondary uses is really important. We have recommendations for how do you achieve greater transparency about who is currently using Spectrum so that people who want a secondary use model uh, uh, have, have, have better information uh, in, and insight into the marketplace. We don't know how these three different business models are going to evolve, but we want to make sure there's enough room for all three of them uh, to compete with each other and to compete in other ways to provide better value and services for the American public and to uh, improve the economy.
Next question from Lynn Stanton. There was a criticism from the Phoenix Center earlier this week, or maybe, mm -hmm. not, maybe not a criticism, but more of a, a suggestion that uh -huh. as, the, as the FCC goes forward with this plan, that its success be judged against whether the country moves up in the yeah. OECD rank, uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation yeah. Development rankings for broadband penetration to right. number nine from its current right. 15th, 16th. Uh, in the past, the Phoenix Center and some other organizations have criticized that ranking yes. as just not really relevant or not well thought out. Um, <laughs> so what is your reaction to now being asked to be judged by it, it, it's, it's a very good question and it's a fair question, but one of the things we found when we looked at a, a large series of studies was that, you know, number one, one should be judged on multiple factors. If you pick any one factor over any others, you're going to bias what you're actually doing. We could be number one in broadband penetration, but if our performance was the slowest in the world, if our applications were the worst, that would not be any victory. We could be the fastest in the world. But if it was a million bucks a month and no one could afford it, that wouldn't be very good. So the point is you have to have a multiplicity of factors. But there's something else that we, we looked at, um, and that is the concept that early on in a technology, and this was exactly true of electricity, I think it was ag exactly true, by the way, of computers, uh, whereas electricity was 100 years ago, computers were 30 years ago. In the early stages, and we are in the early stages, there is something called measurement bias. Uh, that uh, economic historians have pointed to. And that is, you're measuring something based on the way you think in the past. Broadband is a paradigm shifting uh, technology. It is a general purpose technology that is going to allow all kinds of things that we can barely envision today. It will take time for us to figure out what the really right metrics are. I think some folks are getting closer to it, but it generally involves a broad series of metrics rather than a single metric. Universal Service Fund, do you foresee a day when the Universal Service Fund will be dedicated solely to broadband and not landlines? Uh, right now, the Universal Service Fund is dedicated to voice. And we do foresee a day, and we are trying to hasten that day, uh, when the Universal Service uh, supports broadband, really broadband plus voice, because you can now get voice service over broadband. We think it's really important to do. Um, we think actually one of the one of the best things about doing a plan is that it enables a process where you bring lots of different stakeholders in the room together. When we started this process, there was a lot of uh, people thought that this was really an impossible thing. But I think if you look at the reaction to the Universal Service Plan, uh, we rolled it out uh, a few weeks ago, actually before we actually published the plan, and you saw a wide range of folks who were very supportive of what we did. So we think that the planning process has helped drive a political consensus, not unanimity, but a consensus about the direction to go in. And we laid out a three-stage, 10-year plan um, that we think gives markets and businesses time to adjust, but is very clear that we need to move to supporting broadband. I would also note that along with that, there is a somewhat obscure but very, very important um, regime called intercarrier compensation. We also move toward changing the way we, we do that. And that was based a, basically based on voice, based on minutes. Those concepts aren't going to exist in a pure IP world. Um, and so it's very important to, um, uh, to change that system. Um, and we think that if you do change that, a lot of great economic uh, activity can uh, evolve. Blair Levin, both Verizon and AT&T now have expressed concern about the FCC controlling Internet services. Look, th this goes back to what you were talking about earlier with Title I and Title II. It's a very important debate to have. We didn't really engage in that debate uh, in the planning process because that's a kind of a legal uh, political analysis that doesn't make it's, it's, it. The, the planning process we were bringing in a lot of experts, we were bringing in a lot of data, we were looking at health, we were looking at education. This legal question, it's very, very important, but we didn't do that much on it. I will say that at the end of the day, from the planning perspective, we think there has to be a government agency, and we think the FCC in a lot of cases is the right government agency that has the jurisdiction to make sure that broadband is everywhere, uh, to make sure that there are policies that assure it's affordable, that make sure that there are policies that um, that, for, that, that assist with low-income folks, that make sure that we're supporting schools and healthcare facilities with connectivity. 
Um, there are a variety of things. That, you know, we need a we we need to make sure that spectrum is available. There are a variety of things that really I think most people would agree. Government has an appropriate role in doing those things. Um, so, you know, look, lots of people expressed lots of different concerns. We think the plan points in the right direction. We think it's on the right side of history as to what the job is that needs to be done. And other people are going to discuss who is best suited in government to do that. Last question. Um, well, then, the next step for the commission is to develop a timeline for yes. doing all of the proceedings that are needed to yeah. implement the plan. What factors are shaping that timetable? Is it what's most urgent, what you can get the most impact and biggest bang for? Is it commission resources? And just to piggyback, does Congress need to approve the plan? Uh, Congress does not need to approve the plan, though. There are certain core recommendations, such as incentive auctions, where Congress does need to act. But we took the view that in de designing this plan, wherever we could, we were going to have the FCC do it, not, not go to Congress. Um, very quickly, in terms of implementation, there's a variety of different things that need to be done. Uh, we worked from the very beginning with all the different bureaus there, uh, in, in terms of an implementation schedule. So you're balancing resources, you're balancing priorities. Some things you want to start now but are going to take a long time to do because they involve uh, processes that are very data oriented. Some things can be done more quickly. So you'll, you'll see that when you see the, the uh, actual implementation schedule come out. Blair Levin, Lynn Stanton, thank you for being on The Communicators. The National Broadband Plan is available at cspan.org slash communicators. Thanks for being with us.